Listen, I want to uh, take this moment. Uh, my brother Wade, Wade, you're welcome to come on up here, brother. Uh, I've been wanting Wade to share his testimony. Amen. And uh, and he's about to share his full testimony with us. Wade and I go back a while when we first started the Bible study with Robert. Way back in the day when we had the restaurant, me and Wade used to tag team as uh, minister in the gospel. And so I'm excited to hear what the Lord's going to say tonight. Amen. Love you, brother. Praise God. Amen. It's been a while since I've uh, been behind the pulpit. So excuse me if I'm a little nervous. Uh, Hallelujah. It, uh, it, it all come back to me now. Uh, Matt, appreciate the opportunity. I believe this is going to impact some lives. Um, and uh, thank you too, Miss Diane, for giving me the opportunity to get up here and uh, testify. If you would give my testimony a title, it would be the goodness of God. Yes, sir. Yes. There's no other explanation of how to explain it besides the goodness of God. And grace, that's one definition for grace. It's just the goodness of God. Um, but I think it's more profound when you say the goodness of God. Would you agree? Yes. Let's, uh, let's bow and, and, and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Thanking you for all your goodness, your yes. kindness, your yes. mercy. Thanking you for all the things that you have do uh, have done for for me and my family. And you've blessed us tremendously, oh God. And Father, I pray that I would exhort the body of Christ, that I would lift them up, testify of your goodness, and exhibit. Uh, what it should be to serve you. Yes. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Um, the first part of this is, is going to be tough because um, there's some things I want to say that's not easy to say, you know. But if we won't, I might crack up a little bit, but if we want revival, we first must repent. Yes. And, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to get up here and publicly say some things that you are embarrassed of, right. 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 frankly. It's not easy to get up here and say, hey, I was struggling with alcohol, tobacco, uh, gambling, um, drugs. Right. Right. That's, that's not an easy statement to get up here and to confess that, but I like to confess it today yes, yes, that I did it for the last two years. Jesus. I've been struggling, um, struggling with the things that I just now announced to you guys. But I'm not going to hide behind a mask anymore. I'm going to pull the mask off Hallelujah. and I'm allow Jesus to do what Jesus can do in my life. And I'll tell you how it all started, because this may help somebody, and it, and it, 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 it could maybe stop what the enemy is trying to do to most people that have struggled with addiction. It started about two years ago. It was our anniversary, me and my wife. And we went to a restaurant, and we thought, no, we've been saved, we've been living for the Lord, we wasn't drinking, we wasn't smoking, we wasn't doing anything that was outside of, uh, we really wasn't serving God to our full potential, but we wasn't living like a heathen either, you know. Um, but on that third year anniversary, we decided that, oh, we strong enough, we can, we can sip a little alcohol and it'll be okay, you know. And that's where it all started. Did we fall into a full addiction right when that happened? No, it didn't happen. It was progressive. It, it, it was, okay, yeah, we did it, we're okay. And the, yeah, a month or two months later, we felt like we could do it again. And it all progressed into something deeper. Well, now it's not just alcohol, it's tobacco. Now it's not just 
alcohol, tobacco, it's gambling. Right. Now it's not just alcohol, tobacco, gambling, it's popping pills. Mm -hmm. And then the list goes on. That ain't even, that's just the outward sins that's right. happening right. in my life. That ain't even the inward things right. that are going right. on. Right. So, Matt preached this for many years and he still preaches it. He says, if you open that door, and he'd go stand right over there to that door. He'd open that door and he'd go, Voof, put that foot right there. Right, right. And once that devil puts that foot in front of that door, no man can close it. That's right. That's right. No That's man right. can close Preach that door. Right. Only God can close yes. it. Yes. So I, I'm here tonight to tell you that those things don't hinder me anymore. Do I have everything together? No, I don't. I know I'm a work in progress um, because there's some inward things that the Lord has to yeah. deal with me. But the outwardly things, the, uh, the alcohol, the tobacco, the, the gambling, the pills, it's gone. What I want to talk to you guys, what I want to testify tonight of is a word that's probably long forgotten. Um, not too many people even preach on it anymore. We starting to see it here at the church. And we sit we starting to see a move of God. And the word is consecration. Yes. Um, consecration just means it's a simple word. It just means, and it's it sounds like a complicated word, but it's really a simple word. It just means to be filled with, mm. to be filled with. That's good. And when we're filled with God's word, when we're filled with God's spirit, when we think, when we breathe, when we dream, when we speak Jesus then Jesus is going to come out of us but we have to put Jesus in for Jesus to come out amen, amen. amen. Um, we've been praying for a move of God and we're starting to see I think we're in the very beginning of that move um, Matt said something very prophetical I don't know if y'all been getting it over the last few months he says, as the days get dark, uh, the days are dark. This is what he says. The days are dark, but they are getting darker. Yeah. But I'm about to pour out my spirit. And the Lord, he is drawing a line in the sand. People will have to make a decision. Who will you serve? Yeah. Well, I wasn't serving the Lord. And now that sand has been drawn. Mm. And I think he's drawing the sand, not only for me, he's drawing it for each and every one of us. Yeah. He's drawing that. And while I always love the Lord, and once we hear this testimony that I'm fixing to testify of, you will see that I always love the Lord. Yeah. There, there's no question about it. But I'm, not, I didn't always serve him. Yeah. That's right, that's right. There's been periods of my life that was very dark. I was in serious bondage. Um, it seemed at times that I, I, I couldn't see no way out. Uh, that's how dark it got. Uh, very scary at times, even to the point, I'll say this too, it, it, it was almost suicidal. And I had everything I could possibly want in life. Right, and right. still thinking about taking my own life. That's how dark it got at one particular time. I wrote a poem 20 years ago while I was in prison. I, and I'll just give you a little backdrop. I did 12 years in prison. I've probably been in and out over 10 different times counting jail. I've been a bad, bad, bad boy. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, nothing to brag about. It's actually very embarrassing. But 
with those 12 years that I, when I was incarcerated, I dedicated my life to studying the Bible. And I'm talking about sometimes 17 hours of, you know, day and night, not hardly getting any sleep. Um, and I'll get into all of that because it was part of the consecration to the Lord. But I wrote a poem 20 years ago, and it used to be on the internet. I, I'd go back and flip through it every once in a while because you correspond through mail, and then I was, you know, when you do that, it gets on, I don't know how I do it, everything gets on there. Well, now I can't find it. So the Lord kind of, I think, brought it back to my memory, so I re rewrote it of what I think I could remember. And this is what it says. And the title is, Who Am I? Who am I? I used to not know. But now people tell me, because I have a glow. Why of this, Father of all? Because I love you, even when you fall. How, did, how could this be? Because in the eyes of the Lord, I am who I am. And let me break it down for you because it may not be that plain, even though it's simple. It was hard for me to understand. I didn't know who I was at one time. But people, while I was in prison, said, man, you have a glow on you. And I was like, well, I don't see it, but other people did. And I was like, how could God give me a glow when I know I'm a fallen sinner. And, I'd, and, 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 I, and I thought to myself, well, how could this be, God? How could you give me this kind of grace? And he says, because in, in his eyes, not my eyes, I am who I am. He sees me as forgiven. He sees me as saved. He sees me as filled. He sees me as these things that I couldn't see. So, that was one of the first things that the Lord would begin to use me. I would always get these little songs in my head, and I never would write them down, but my mind was so filled with Christ while I was in there. And Robert can testify, because that's where I met Robert at, is in prison, that we said, walking on the yard one day, man, if they gave us the keys to get out we wouldn't leave. Now that's pretty powerful to, to say, hey, if the warden would come right now and give us the key that says you're free to go, we was not ready to leave prison. That's powerful. Because God was doing the work. We were in Bible college. We were, things were happening that was in the miraculous that I, it's hard for me at some points to even explain Look, the church, the, the church is in a poor state of being right now. Could we all agree on yes. that? Yes. Yeah, yes. The world is in a very bad place. Yes. Yeah. But the church, let me say this. Christ is not coming back for a week and defeat the church. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that, that, that ain't what the Bible tells me. The Bible tells me in Ephesians chapter 5, I think maybe verse 27, that he's coming back for a church that is a, a glorious church, not having spot, not no wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy without blemish. He says in another scripture in Peter, I, I think it says, "Be ye holy, for I am holy." It said in, in in Genesis in the very beginning, he tells Abraham. I am the almighty God. Walk before me. Be thou perfect. Yes. He's, he's wanting us to get to this position and place in our life where we're not struggling with sin. Out there. Yes. Um, he wants us to get to a place where we can be used by him. Yes. We cannot. Listen, I, I, I'm going to break it down to you by facts. Now, I know we use faith in church, but I'm a factual person. I'm going to break it down by facts. The Lord does not use somebody that is in a state of being that is, is, is 
constantly going around the mulberry bush over and over again. What I mean by that, like the children of Israel in the desert, they kept going in the circle, in the circle. God wasn't using them. He just wasn't. God uses people when they're on fire. If we go back and look at church history, we'll look at the Wesleys. We can look at the Azusa Street. We can look at all these great men of God, these great movements. These men of God were consecrated to the Lord. They wasn't fooling around. Uh, I've read some of that Smith Wigglesworth guy, man. They said just by his presence, people would go and confess their sins to him. Because the Spirit of God was on him. We got to get to that place, church. It's imperative for us to get back. And I, and I think the Lord's going to use this testimony to get some people back to where they need to be. I really believe it. Um, he's not going to move without, a, number one, a repentant heart. Uh, a clean spirit. He's not coming back for an old defeated person. He's not going to use that person. You don't even want to be used if you're defeated. Let's right. just right. be honest. That's you know, right. do you even want to be used when you when you beat being beat up by the devil? Nah, that ain't happening anyhow. But God is ready and willing. He is He is arming us. He He's giving everybody. We've been sitting under Matt, one of the best teachers. Amen. Can you can you say that one of the best teachers? And I'm not just saying that out of saying it. That is the truth. Yes. He is one of the best. Amen. And God is anointing him to do it. We have to have the anointing of the Holy Spirit to carry out what God wants us to carry out. All right, I want to jump right here into um, my testimony. The um, the Lord would begin to speak to me, and at a very young age, none of my family were were, were were saved. I can remember I was probably six, seven years old, and I could feel this hovering over me. I didn't know what it was at that. It wasn't like an evil presence or nothing. It was a good presence, but I could not really identify at the age six or seven what it was. And without nobody bringing me to church, I definitely didn't have a clue what was going on at that particular time. But I had a dream as a little bitty boy. I had a dream, and in that dream, I was on a train. And in that train was my dad's side of the family. And that train, it was going super at like lightning speed. I was a little bitty boy and I could see all the grown-ups around me and my cousins, aunts and uncles, grandparents, stuff like that. And that train came to a stop and it just a screeching halt. And there was something not seen but forced us out, like kicked us out the train. And but we couldn't see it. And there was three doors. Everything was in this maroon. Now I can remember this all the way as a little bitty boy, this dream. There was three doors. And they circled up around me. And I was in the center of the circle. And they were all discussing, what door is it? What door is it? Where's three doors? What door is it? And they kept, and finally they came to the conclusion, I had the answer. But right before I could conclude the answer, I woke up from the dream. Now that's when I was a little bitty boy. And the Lord reminded me when I went to prison of that dream and what it meant, and I'll get into it a little later. So kind of keep that in your thought process. Fast forward up to the age of 13. I was a troubled kid, I in and out of trouble even. You know, there, there was, Things said about me, prophesied over me, that wasn't good. I'd be in Angola uh, by the time I was 18. Uh, I wouldn't see the age of 17. Now, this is grown men saying this. Uh, he's, he ain't going to make it 17. I give him 17, he'll, he'll be dead, you know. Uh, 
It was awful, you know, they would just, con they, that song by Aaron Neville came out, Angola Bound, they used to sing that about me. I was, and hey, I did end up in prison, not Angola, but I did go to prison. Um, so troubled teen, 13 years old, using drugs, alcohol, and using um, illicit drugs like LSD, you know, hallucinogenics. Something that a 13 year old mind couldn't really handle at that particular time. Going back into the early 90s, this stuff was very strong. And so I take some LSD one weekend. And throughout, it wasn't, I don't know, I guess it takes about 45 minutes, an hour to, to, to kick in. And then into the, they call it, LSD, they call it tripping. Um, if you don't understand what that is, I mean, that was the terminology back then. I don't know what it would be called now, but back then it was called tripping. <laughs> and I had what you call a bad trip. And what happened was it was so bad that I went to my parents, to my dad, and I said, Dad, I took some drugs and I feel like I'm dying. You know, he didn't really know what to say, so he gets me in the vehicle and uh, starts to bring me to the hospital. But in the meantime, it's like I experienced at a very young age what it was like, because I thought I was dead and I was going to hell. That's what was going through my mind. And I'm gonna tell you this feeling, it wasn't just the thought, but it was a literal feeling of my soul leaving my body and I could not sense. Right now, we're in church, we can sense God, but humanity in general can sense God because God, his spirit is everywhere. But when you're separated from God, that is an awful feeling. And it was just intensifying that, pre that thought that was going through my head. I was going to hell and this was how I was gonna feel for the rest of my life and then I was just waiting for the judgment. It was so awful that you'd think, man, how would you ever go back and even do another drug? Well, I didn't for years, you know, and fast forwarding it all the way up to the age of 18 where I really could get into some, some trouble. Then I started experimenting with different other types of drugs and uh, found myself in prison. Now I had so many charges stacked up against me that probably the Pope could get me out of prison. I mean, there, I, from, uh, from parish to parish to parish to parish, I mean, I had them stacked up. I wasn't a very successful uh, drug dealer. I was, uh, and I was good with finances, but when it came, because the Lord had a different plan for That's my right. life. He wasn't, he wasn't gonna let me succeed in that. Yeah. So I'd always run it. I was like, man, well, how am I the one that's always getting busted? You know, I'm like, I'm calculating all this stuff. I'm maneuvering this over here and that, and I'm still getting caught up. I'm like, man, well, this is a pretty good, so I, I finally, I, I go, I, I'm on this, one of the times I'm in, I'm in jail and um, everybody used to come try to preach to me. Oh man, they, I was like, man, get away with all that. I'm using the Bible for a crutch. Uh, you know, I was like, if I'm gonna serve the Lord when I get out, I'm gonna serve the Lord. I'm not gonna do it while I'm in prison. Well, there's this guy, he was dying. His name was Bobby Yates. I don't know if he's still alive or not, never looked him up, but he, this was in the year 2000. He said, hey man, he tried to preach to him. I was like, look, I ain't using that for a crutch. I got the game in my bank. I'm never, I'm never changing. And that's how serious I was about living that lifestyle. And he goes, man, just let me read the Bible to you. How about that? And finally I gave in after he was very persistent. So he would come sit down. Now this is a guy that's dying. This guy don't have many years left of his life. He's, you know, he's, he's full blown AIDS and fixing to die, but he's taking the time out to sit on the side of my bunk and read me the Bible till I fall asleep every single morning. 
So after six months, I ended up beating the charge, getting out. It's a long story. Y'all need to know about that. But I get out. And as soon as I get out, it's like all that stuff went right out the window, man. And right at the end, I actually picked up the Bible for myself and began to read. And guess where he had me reading from? Romans chapter 6. <laughs> Can you believe that? So, and I didn't understand a word of it. I, I tried, you know, but I didn't, couldn't get it. But anyhow, so as soon as I get out, uh, drinking, popping pills, back at it, you know, well, three days into it, fixing to set up this humongous drug deal, I had to pay off the lawyer and do some other stuff, and just in the mess of all this. Well, anyhow, almost get caught up again in three days, right after I, uh, you know, the guy been reading the Bible to me, and I never said yes to Jesus at that particular point, anyhow. And so got out doing all that stuff, and almost get busted again, escaped. And as soon as I got home that night, I'm laying in my bed, and I'm thinking, man, you ain't been out for three days. You did X, Y, and Z. You tried to set up this big old drug. Here. You almost got, you got pulled over. You almost got arrested again. You are fixing to go right back to prison. And as, and I'm laying down. I'm, all these thoughts are going through my mind at supersonic speed. And I was a little clogged up. It was springtime. And all of a sudden, the air condition at my daddy's house kicked on. But it's making this weird noise. It's, Yum, 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 yum. And I'm like, man, what is going on? It's 11 o'clock at night. And as soon as that air came out of that vent into my nostrils, I automatically could breathe. And I was like, man, something's in this house. So I get up and I go through our hall and I look at the thermostat. The thermostat's on hall. Now I'm really freaked out. <laughs> I can breathe. I was just stopped up. That air that came through that vent did something to me. The air conditioned thermostat says off. I go to the living room. I sit on the couch and I got my, I'm sitting down. I got my, my hands on my knees like this. And it wasn't maybe 30 seconds into it. I'm just staring off at the entertainment system, at the TV. And it was like lightning. It was like so powerful, it hit me. And when it hit me, the power of God hit me so hard, it dropped me down on my knees and my hands. And I began to weep so loud, so profusely that my parents get up. I'm on the ground crying a, a puddle of tears and repenting. And after about five to 10 minutes into this, now I heard this because my stepmom told me, she goes, the next day, she goes, you were speaking in a different language. <laughs> the Lord saved me right there. He filled me right there. But it was what was happening at this lightning speed and it was so powerful that it beggars description because I, I don't have, my, my vocabulary is not adequately, enough, it's not adequate to describe what happened, but I could remember what that guy was saying on the side of me, he said, Jesus, now the power of God was on me so strong that I thought Jesus was coming back right then. Wow. If, if I was a bad man, I'd have bet it all in the that's how powerful this was, what was happening to me. And I'm trying to get up and I can't get up, but I finally, I take each of my hands and I grab my leg and I moved it step by step because I remember what that guy Bobby Yates said. He says, Jesus, he read that story to me. Jesus can be like lightning in the sky. So I had to get out to that door and see if, if I could see some lightning in that sky. So I, I'm, I'm literally taking each leg, boom, trying to make myself move. The, my body is vibrating. I'm talking about the power of God is on me like, like I've never felt. And I finally, I get to the door. I can remember I opened, I looked outside. I don't see no lightning. My dad was right around at the bar. I turned around, I pointed at him. 
I said, you best believe that there is a God and he wants to do something with me. I don't know what, and he jetted out. He ran to his room. <laughs> He, he said, boy, that boy's on some stuff tonight. <laughs> and that was the beginning. Now, as powerful as that was, you would think, man, how in the world could he get himself wrapped back up in this mess again? And I scratch my head sometimes. Uh, how in the world would I do it? Well, I knew. Now, once my dad and them jetted back to their bed, they thought I was crazy and everything, I'm sure. I, I got to get a Bible. I was like, I took that Bible home that Bob, Bobby Yates gave me, man. I'm going through that Bible and I'm reading that Bible. And all of a sudden, my daddy and stepmom were drinkers and they were smokers. And it, it was like the Lord let me see through his eyes for about two hours. And I saw, I was like, man, how did I put that in my body? It, it's like he just opened my eyes to what the stuff was really doing to me for about two hours. And it was, I was in disbelief how I could ever do such a thing. Well, let me show you how powerful addiction is. So within, I, I knew I had to get in a church, never been in a church all my life. Uh, I might have visited a couple of services here and there, but I worked for a Pentecostal preacher. I went to his church one time, went down to the altar. You know, nothing ever changed. You know, there was that, and one other time I can remember, I went to a production called uh, Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flames, something like that. Went down to the altar, nothing changed, but something changed that night in my dad's living room. So he let me see through the lens of his eyes and saw how disgusting some of that stuff was. I'm reading through the Bible like a, like a madman, you know, just scouring through the pages. I knew in my heart, I was like, I gotta get in the church, I gotta get in the church, I gotta get in some kind of church. And every day that went by, the experience faded just a little. Every day that that experience would fade just a little, it wasn't working. And I went back to what I knew. Now, this is gonna sound pretty strange, but I gotta tell the truth. I'm driving to go to the guy's house who I usually get stuff from to make the deal. And I'm halfway, I mean directly halfway marking point. And I hear in my mind, don't go. Two words, don't go. I drive a little bit further, I hear it again, don't go. And then I drove even a little bit further and then I heard it audibly. First time I ever heard God's voice audibly. Don't go, this is what I did. This, this is it's disgusting. I shook my head like this. Ah! I wanted it out of my head. And I went. Got the stuff. It just started raining. <coughs> In Gonzales, there's a lot of cur curvy roads, very narrow. I was doing about 45 miles an hour. Now, tell me the same thing, thank you, God. Even in the mess, driving, loaded up with drugs, going about 45, 50 miles an hour around these curves. It just, they said the road's the slickest when it just rains, it just rained. And I'm going through this hard, hard curve at 45 miles an hour. Only God could do this. This was a true miracle. Spun around at 45 miles an hour, did a complete 360 and kept going. Never missed the beat, but I pulled the car over, got out, got on my knees and said, oh God, thank you. Because there was an oak tree the size, eight feet in diameter, it would have took me out. God took his hand, spun that little car around and let me keep going straight. Three days later, I get caught up again. 
go to jail, facing numerous charges. That's when I said, Lord, whatever you want to do with me, I surrender. I surrender. It's been a battle, but getting to this point where I want to talk to you guys about is how the Lord used me while I was in prison and the things that he let me see, the things that I um, experienced. And uh, I was a pastor in prison while I was in prison for two years. And God used me mightily while I was in prison. And that's what we, me and Rob, we feel like we're called back to the prisons. That's our calling. We said that from day one. And let me tell you this. This is another miracle. There's miracles all over this thing. Pete Griffin is a miracle. Uh, me and Robert's relationship is a, is, a, is a miracle because I was standing at the water fountain in 2002. I looked at Robert. He was fixing to go to a different facility. I looked at Robert and said, Rob, I said, I don't know what it is, but God's going to do something with me and you. I don't know what it is, but God is going to use us together one day for something. And twin, listen, when God prophesies something, it may not come when you want to, but it'll come just on time. 20 years later, we form a business, Pete Griffin. One of the most successful businesses. I've been in many businesses. This is the most successful business I've ever been in. And thanks be to God. It's because of his hand. So the consecrated life, like I said, there was there was hours upon hours upon hours upon hours that I would put into the Bible, not just reading the Bible, prayer. Um, fasting. Uh, I live, breathe, dream. Everything was Jesus. Jesus was coming into me. Jesus was coming out of me. Uh, and that's where we got to get. That's where I got to get as a born again believing Christian. That's where I have to get. And if we want to see these miracles, if we want to see, if we want to have that anointing, it's available, but there's some things that we got to do. We're not trying to, I'm not trying to earn my salvation. That's been paid for a long time ago. But there's some things that we got to do if we want that anointing to flow. Yes, that's it. So one of the first things, how ironic this is, this is how the Lord would build my faith to believe for these dreams and visions that he would give me while I was in prison. And one of the first things that he showed me is where it, I wasn't three months till I said, okay, Lord, whatever you want to do with me, I surrender. Uh, the first thing he showed me is I, w I had a dream one night and I was on a plane. And in that plane, on that plane, uh, there was another plane that flew on side of me and I had a window seat and I could see the plane and that plane ran, uh, went into this big humongous structure and blew up and I said wow that was crazy that's scary and then the plane that I was on it came and it you know in dreams it kind of you know it's it, it probably could have happened but it landed like on the interstate. It let me out. I left, got out the plane. The plane took back off. I look off into the distance. I see that plane hit a structure. Boom, and blow up. Not even a week later, I'm watching TV. 2001 September. Wow. The two planes hit that. The Lord told me, showed you that I showed you that and I was like whoa that got me on my knees praying Lord show me more give me more I want to see more if you can show me that show me more 
The second thing that happened, now, I was filled with the Holy Spirit, but I didn't even know I was filled with the Holy Spirit only because of what my stepmom told me. So there was a service three months into this thing, and we were in service. God preached. He preached on salvation, but then he called for the baptism with the Holy Spirit, with the other and speaking in tongues. And he said, you don't have to come up here. Just sit in your seat, stand in your seat, or stay, you know, in your seat, in the line, in the pew. And raise your hands up to the Lord and repeat after me if you want to get filled. Well, I knew I was filled. And so I just kind of just stood there. But the guy on the side of me, I just kind of stopped praying. And I looked to the side, and he was like, man, he wanted it. And the Lord just told me, he says, look, just reach over and touch him. And I did. In fact, and dude went, I just whoop, barely touched him. That dude went out speaking in tongues. I was like, whoa, what was that? And it was just because of the laying on of hands. I was obedient to the voice of God, did what he said to do in the man. So that now faith is really starting to resonate in my life. Well, I had a dream one night, a buddy of mine, he OD'd while I was in prison. Now this guy, he was good as gold. He'd give you the shirt off his back. And there was, it was hard for me to believe that he could be in the devil's head. It was just tough for me to believe that. But I was like, Lord, I know what your word says. Right. If he didn't give his life and his heart to you, he's in the devil's hell. But it was hard for me to believe and accept it. I got on my knees one night and I was like, Lord, where is my, I don't want to say his name, where's my buddy at? And uh, I went to sleep that night. And when I woke up in this dream, everything is in black and white. I saw this old shack and this old tree that didn't have no leaves on it, but it was just a, a naked tree. Uh, but everything was in black and white and I saw my buddy in between the old house and that tree and I can remember I, I cried out his name I was like hey where are you and I cut my hands I can even remember what I did and he did the same thing but there was a pause in between when I said hey where are you there was a pause and then he hollers back and says, I'm in a place you don't want to be. I woke up sweating, cold sweat, got on my knees and, and prayed and was like, oh God, how painful that must be. Blew my mind, but God's word is truth. And what he says, he means. And He's not mincing words when he says, be holy for I'm holy. Yeah. Listen, he made seven statements in the book of Revelations in two and three, Revelations two and three. He who overcomes, I'll give you such and such. He who overcomes, I'll give you this. He who overcomes, you won't get this. He's wanting us to overcome. Yeah. He's not wanting us to be defeated. Yes. And we, Take heed to these words because this is the true testimony. I'm not making none of this up. So one night here, I used to get this kick on my bum while I was in prison. I'm like, man, I wake up, it's two o'clock in the morning, everybody's in there snoring. I'm like, I know nobody's playing no games. They don't do that in real prison anyhow because you get killed. Um, I'd wake up and I was like, Man, what's going on? What's going on? So finally, after a couple of times, I knew it was my cue to get on my knees and pray. So that would happen periodically to me. One night, same thing, I got that bump, boom. But they had these two guys that were talking, you know, when we get out in the world, they, you know, they were talking all kind of gang stuff, just put it to you that way. And that and it was like three bumps down for me. And that night I go to bed and I get that wake up, boom. 
but I can't move. I'm in a paralyzed state. All I could do is move my eyes left to right, back and forward. But in that same spot, when where those guys were talking all that gangster stuff, or whatever, that gang stuff, those, I couldn't look directly at them. I could only see them out the peripheral of my vision. They moved at supersonic speed and then they began to come and hover over me and choke me and hold me down. But the thought of Jesus, just the very thought of Jesus, and they had to let me go. That's power. There's power in the name of Jesus. So that would happen to me quite often, the thump. And one, one afternoon, you know, they gave inmates in big prison uh, a chance. You know, we'd get to preach, and there was pastors and deacons, and just like a regular church on, on the outside, as there is on the, out here in society. And I thought that the guy that was preaching, I was like, man, I should be, I mean, I was on fire for the Lord. I wanted to preach every opportunity I had. And I just, you know, the Lord was showing me these little visions and stuff, and I was just like, man, I thought I should have been up there preaching. So filled with jealousy and envy to the point of that night when I went back to my bunk. And this is a good friend of mine. I'm like, man, how could I think about him in those ways? And even to the point where I questioned, how can a saved person think about their one of their best friends while they're in prison? When they're preaching God's word. How can I feel that way towards him, questioning my salvation. So I go to sleep that night. I'm being, I'm in this room, it's pitch black. I'm, my body's being tossed from wall to wall. I'm not being hurt, I'm just being tossed where I can't come to a standstill. Finally, my body comes to a calm place where I'm just standing there. And from here to maybe the back of the wall, illumination came in the form of a man like hot glowing metal and without a word being said it drew me I didn't walk over there it drew me to him and the being in the form of a man hot glowing lava like an amber color sticks his hand out and I'll stick my hand out and on the inside of that hot glowing hand, because I couldn't see the full fingers, I felt a man's handshake. And in that man's handshake, when I shook his hand, something came out of me and went into him. Woke up. I go, God, what was that? He brought me into Ezekiel chapter 1, 28. And it basically tells what I saw, saw God in his spirit body. Then he took me to a place in the New Testament. He says, son, you're, I'm in you. I'm in him. He showed me my soul was in him. He clarified every doubt that I had about being saved. He showed me. He supernaturally showed me that I was in him. Literally. We are literally in Christ Jesus. Yes. He, we're literally in his body. Yeah. That's yeah. truth. Yeah. I'm a, coming to the end, I think this is probably the most profound thing that happened to me while I was there in prison. This, because those were all dreams, what I'm fixing to tell you, is a vision that I literally saw with my own eyes. And this is how I know that I know. I'm, I already knew that I knew. Uh, but when I saw what I saw, I knew that if they took every Bible away from me, that it wouldn't shake my faith. Because I've seen it with my eyes, and this is what happened. That same bump, bump, bump on the side of my bump. I woke up in that paralyzed state. Couldn't move my eye. I mean, couldn't move my body. I only could move my eyes, left, right, back, and forward. 
what was now in prison, there's big tall seat ceilings, 15 foot in the air, you know, and you're in a little bitty single bunk. It's not, it wasn't double bunk back then, it was just single bunk. And, um, and it's about 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning. It seems like that's when all these things would happen, late, late in the midnight hour. I'm sitting, I'm laying in that bed and my eyes are wide open and what I see is the most beautiful creation I've ever laid my eyes on. And it was three. The one that was in front of me had long flowing hair of a uh, dark complexion. Uh, I could see the full body and the beam went from the top of my bunk all the way to the top of the ceiling, 12 foot, had, you know, if you take off the bunk height, had a book in his hand. I, the only thing I heard was the inscription in that book. And he, as fast as I could think, he would write. As fast as I was thinking, he would write. The two that was behind me, I could only see from the waist up. And I was trying with all of my strength. I wanted to just touch them. The two that was behind me was of a olive complexion. I could still see their, the strands of their hair. It was a short, low haircut, solid gold, not a blemish. They looked like identical twins that were behind me. Not a blemish on their face. Beautiful, beautiful beings. But the one that was above my bed had that book in his hand and he was writing. I mean, he was looking around, but he was looking at me and that's what, as whatever I was thinking, I know he was writing. I knew it in my heart. After about three minutes into it, I said this in my heart. I was like, oh my goodness, I'm in the presence of God's holy angels. And in that fear of, of reverence, came all over me just to know that I'm in the presence of his angels. Not that I was giving glory to his angels, but I was just into the presence of his holy angels. And as soon as that happened, I woke up, I was released out of it, I got on my knees and I began to pray. I was like, Lord, what, what's all this for? What, is, what do you, why? And this is what he told me. He says, everything is being accounted for. Mm. Everything, even while you sleep, your dreams, your thoughts. And I was like, I went to the book of Revelation, chapter 20, somewhere in the back of the book. And it speaks about judgment day. People who don't give their life to the Lord will be judged out of those books, plural. There's many books that are written about our lives. And they're stored. There's a great library in heaven. I've, I've, I've never been to heaven, but I know that there's a great library because of those books. And if your name's not in the book, the book of life, then you will be judged out of those books, plural. That's a sobering thought, my friend, that everything, you, you, we think we're getting away with something. God's not allowing us to get away with anything. And guess what? On that Dima seat of Christ, some of that stuff's going to be burnt up, you know. But the good stuff, there's good stuff that's being written too about our lives. Nothing is wasted with God. No matter how far and deep depression you might have been or you've gone into, no, no matter how far, look, sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay. It, it, it does things to you that it still blows my mind. After all those experiences, how could I ever? But Satan, you know, he throws those lures out. Yeah. And if you bite on it and you do like Pastor Matt says, you open that door That's and right. that devil puts that foot in there, there's only one man that can close yes. it. And That's right. Right. Yeah. 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 
Thank you, Jesus. Well, well with closing, Brother Matt, if you want to yeah. come up here and, you well, know, maybe if, you know, people, you know, maybe somebody in here tonight, they want to they take the mass of religion off, or even the mass of Christianity, you know, who's not serving the Lord, you know, we just have a, you know, a relationship that's cordial, you know, we're not in love with Jesus, we need to be in love with Jesus, <laughs> Amen. we need to be so in love with Jesus that we can't even think about breaking his heart, yeah. and if you have that mask of religion on tonight, I've had, I'm, I'm, here telling you right now that if you want to be free, there's something about publicly confessing. I'm not telling you to do it. Matt led it did a few weeks ago. He confessed some stuff. That's what gave me the inspiration to actually get up here and want to, I felt in my heart, if I want to be used by God, I got to get some things out in the front and open. And I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is a power in salvation. You know, God's not looking for us just to say a quick little prayer and say everything's all right. If we're faith, you know, in 1 John 1 and 9, it says, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And people use that all the time. But a little, let me tell you something, my friend, a little prayer just oh lord please forgive me and you think he's you're done with it that ain't that ain't true repentance yeah. true repentance means that you turn away from it yeah you know, resist the devil and you'll flee from it. yeah there's some things that we got to do to get ourselves right but the holy spirit wants to partner with us tonight Yes. To get rid of these things, to take off the mass of religion, to take off the even the mass of Christianity yes. and be a true soldier for the Lord. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.